This is the six takeaways from The Mandalorian Chapter 20, although one of the shortest episodes for The Mandalorian, if not the shortest episode, it was also one of the most exciting. There's a lot to get into, there's even a surprise in there I wasn't expecting, so without further ado, let's jump straight into it. So, the first box today is going to go to culture. Mandalorian culture. It's something we open the episode with, seeing the Mandalorian sparring outside the cave. This reminded me of something that Death Watch believed, and that was that Mandalorians should keep the way of the warriors and conquerors. So, with the Children of the Watch being somewhat of a splinter group from Death Watch, it makes sense that they also keep them with deals as well. Now, we see Bo-Katan walking through the crowd. She's obviously, in my opinion, being reminded of her childhood on Mandalore. She would have grown up in a similar situation to what these Mandalorians are doing now. It might be reminding her of that. We do hear her mention her childhood a few times in this series, so it's an interesting one to keep an eye on for sure. Now, this episode also shows us Grogu's first piece of combat training as a foundling. She had a bit of navigation training in the M1 with Din, but this time around he's going up against Ragnar Vizna, the next in line for House Vizsla. Now this is Paz Vizsla's son, so also a descendant of the first Mandalorian Jedi Tar Vizsla. They go up against each other using practice darts, which leave like a green paint on you when you're hit, rather than the one-shot kill darts that Jengo Fett uses. Um, now, Ragnar goes two up on Grogu, who just kind of stands there. And then after a pep talk from Din Djarin, Grogu then utilizes the force jump that he worked on with Luke, and he gets three shots away on Ragnar straight away, and he comes out victorious on his first combat training session. At this point in time, I thought Paz Vizsla was going to absolutely hit the roof. I thought he was a bit annoyed, well, to say it lightly, uh, that Din and Bo have joined his group and have been welcomed in. I thought he was going to cause a bit of a stinker for that, uh, but then after seeing his son be defeated by Grogu, I thought he'd put it down to cheating maybe by using the force, but that goes a completely different way which we'll come on to in a moment. Now before Grogu's bit of training, Bo mentions to Grogu that Din Djarin is very much like her dad was, and he's that way because he's proud of him. So that's another mention now, Bo-Katan's childhood. So maybe that could be something we need to keep an eye on because, you know, maybe she is remembering her childhood more because her beliefs are going back to the same way they used to be when she was a child. So box number two is going to be for the Order 66 flashback scene. Now, we finally see Grogu's Order 66 flashback scene that was teased heavily in the trailers. And we also see who saved Grogu from the temple and who comes through them doors. Now, this was brought on by the sound of the armor of forging Grogu some new armor for himself, and he went back. This is an extended scene where we get some good shots of Coruscant, good shots of the Jedi Temple up in smoke, and we see clone troopers being voiced by Tamara Morrison. So Boba Fett did manage to get in there at one way or the other. Maybe he'll come in physically later on in the series. Um, so it's revealed that Grogu was saved by a Jedi master named Kellerin Beck who is portrayed by Ahmed Best, the same actor who portrayed Jar Jar Binks. Now, Kellerin is kind of like a dean of the Jedi Temple. He originated from a game uh, back in 2020 called Star Wars Jedi Challenges, and he was nicknamed the Sabered Hand because he was so good with his lightsabers. Now, he trained Jedi Padawans. He was a master uh, during the prequel time, so he would have known all the Jedi Masters during the prequels, um, and obviously he trained Grogu for a time as well. So this leads me to think, could he then make a reappearance, being a new character in The Mandalorian in current times to continue training Grogu as Luke's not doing it? And maybe to also help Din Djarin with a Darksaber as he's having trouble wielding that. Well, you've got a master lightsaber wielder right there. He's obviously going to help him in my opinion. So we'll see. It's worth noting, and this is something else people are talking about. Grogu's transport off a of Coruscant is uh, in a Naboo Star Cruiser. Now, some people are saying this is Jar Jar's ship. And he sent it there to pick up any surviving Jedi and save them, just like the Jedi once saved him. There is more to it than that, which I'm going to dig into in another video, but I want to really investigate and flush out that theory before I put it out there on the channel. So, uh, something to keep an eye on, and if you've got anything to add to that, then let me know in the comments. It'd be good to hear from you. Now, box number three is Bo's integration into the group. Now, unlike her own forces, which melted away when she had nothing to offer them, she didn't have the Darksaber. The Children of the Watch welcomed her in with open arms. And during this episode, she also honoured her house, but not just her house, all of Mandalore. And these are the words of the armourer uh, when she done the highest honour uh, of the Creed, which is to rescue a foundling, being Paz Vizsla's son after it was snatched away from that bird. Which, by the way, 
Paz Vizsla's son Ragnar seems to be a meal for everything this season. If he doesn't start defending himself soon, he's not going to be around for the end of the season at this rate. So she took the lead on that rescue. She showed excellent leadership skills. If she does one day go on to rule Mandalore, I think she's already achieved the hard part, which is getting the support of the Children of the Watch. You know, they wouldn't have wanted Bo-Katan leading them not too long ago. Now, it looks like that could be a possibility. It looks like they would probably be okay with it. But I've actually got a theory on the ruler of Mandalore and who that's going to be. Um, which I'm going to put out in another video uh, but it's not as straightforward as you think it's going to be so keep an eye out for that one guys she does get on well with Paz the armorer uh, it's something I didn't expect I thought you know they would kind of clash but Bo-Katan seems to really just be riding the wave at the moment and going along with it and uh, I think as a part of her that is actually coming around to the idea of their way of being a Mandalorian you know um, that's until she removes her helmet uh, I think that will happen at some point now there does need to be a compromise on the horizon because it's clear here that the Mandalorians are uniting you know slowly but they are uniting so there will need to be some sort of compromise on the whole helmet situation you know because otherwise children of the watch and the new Mandalorians they're never going to see eye to eye and there's other factions out there that also don't get along as well so they're going to have to find a common ground now that brings me on to box number four, which is the big reveal. As Bo-Katan is getting some new armor forged for her by the armorer, and this time it's going to be a signet of the Mythosaur to represent what she saw. Uh, she lost uh, one of her Night Owl ones when she was fighting the large bird creature, uh, so she's got one of each now. Uh, she tells the armorer, you know, I saw a real Mythosaur effectively. The armorer kind of brushes it under the carpet. Well, we all see things, you know, when we follow the way. Um, basically like you're a bit of a, a crazy person um or, or even referred to it as a vision now Bo knows what she saw so i think Bo's next move now will be to return to mandalore to see for herself and to confirm it wasn't a vision uh, but it's a big step for Bo to come out and say that that really takes away any kind of speculation that she had something sinister up her sleeve or she was going to go behind their back she's told him now she's been up front they didn't believe her that's on them or the armorer now box number five today is going to be for House Vizsla. I didn't just put Paz Vizsla because there's more than one of them now. Paz Vizsla's story went in a complete different way this episode. We saw him truly grateful to Din Djarin and bo for them helping rescue Ragnar. Uh, without them, it wouldn't have happened. Now, in that bird's nest when we got there, we saw that so many other foundlings have been taken from that Mandalorian uh, clan there, that cluster, that sect, whatever you want to call them, um, to that nest, and they've not been rescued. That's outside of their range. Um, so if it wasn't for Bo and Din, Ragnar, Paz's son, would have been gone. But they really pulled together. They saved him. And there's a moment when they're on the cliff where Paz says thank you to Din. You can you can hear the emotion in his voice. Um, Din says this is the way. That was a really touching moment. But I think now Paz Vizsla is going to be team Din, team Bo going forwards. No issue with him at all. Um, but also, yeah, so... Ragnar Vizsla, let's talk about him briefly. So we've got another descendant of Tar Vizsla now. So when Paz Vizsla does you know, finally go, then we've still got a Vizsla, a Mandalorian Vizsla out there in the galaxy. Legendary family, so it's only right that they should be carried on. So uh, that's pretty cool. Box number six today is going to go for Ahmed Best. Special mention for him today. Now, this man went through such a tough time during the prequel trilogy um, for his portrayal of Jar Jar Binks. Everyone... Not everyone, but there's a group of fans that completely obliterated him in terms of being nasty, um, you know, personally being nasty to him, not just for his uh, portrayal of the character, the character itself, but actually directing hate to him personally. Completely wrong. People just can't, you know, identify, it seems, between a character and an actor. The actor is only doing what is written for the character. And the actor didn't write the character, okay? So, um, this similar thing happens, you know, with Hayden Christensen, Anakin Skywalker. Uh, he got absolutely bashed during the prequels and Ahmed Best to the point where he didn't want to be here anymore, which is really sad. So, I'm really glad that nowadays these actors are getting the respect, the love from the fans that they deserve. Um, you know, he came back this time around as a Jedi Master. Hopefully, we get more of him appearing as well. Uh, so, hopefully... Oh, my best is here to stay. You know, he has been involved in Star Wars with the uh, video game for a little while, but it looks like he's made his return to live action. So it's one of them feel-good stories that I'm really happy that he's uh, come back and he's getting 
getting the love from the fans he deserves. So my overview of this episode, I would give it an 8 out of 10. It's a good solid episode. It gave us more of what we wanted last week with Bo and Din, what was happening there. But it does highlight the weird pacing of the last episode. We had no mention of Coruscant this, year, this week. Um, Pershing, not a mention. That whole story arc, nothing mentioned. Nothing seems relevant in this episode to what happened last episode on Coruscant. So that's really strange. But for this episode, though, overall, I'm happy with it. We've got some big reveals, big moments. Um, we've got a new Jedi making appearance as well. So that's pretty cool. Um, I think now they're going to really crank up the second half of the series, bearing in mind... All the trailer footage now is pretty much out of the way, so we're going into this next half blind, guys. Uh, I have to see what happens. But there's going to be some good theory videos coming out this week. If you want to catch them, make sure you subscribe. Leave a like if you enjoyed today's video. This is the way.